Hello and welcome to this Red Gaming Tech video, myself Amata, where as always I'm here with the latest from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. We are going to kick things off with something pretty fresh off the presses today, with HoloLens 2. Now this was pretty much just announced by Microsoft at a conference in Barcelona, where they revealed a bunch of stuff about HoloLens 2, most of which are going to be revolving around the improvements versus the original device. Now, unfortunately, one thing they haven't been able to bring down is the price. In fact, it has actually increased versus the original. It is $3,500. Of course, the original was $3,000. So, again, this is not a device that was, or is, should I say, intended for the everyday consumer. But, of they are pretty much saying that you know HoloLens 2 isn't meant for the everyday person, but HoloLens 3 might be. And Microsoft is clearly and honestly targeting businesses with this particular device. They are not targeting you or I. They're very, very aware that obviously some people may have the cash kicking around to, to, to buy one if they're interested, but it's not really meant for sort of mass level, at the moment at least. I'm sure they are eventually intending it to be that, but for the moment... Not really, especially at that price. Now, one of the improvements that Microsoft have added is the ability to let app developers have access to eye tracking, as they have included sensors near the nose ridge of HoloLens 2, which could be used to, say, let you log in, or, again, just to do eye tracking. Now, it does actually track your hands a lot better than previously, which is good because it is going to be relying purely on hand gestures and voice commands to actually well, control the device. Now, the main criticism of the original HoloLens, from what you, I'm sure you recall, is the criticisms regarding the limited field of view. And that is the main thing they have addressed here. They have doubled the field of view versus the original. It is now up to 52 degrees. Not as much as a VR headset or your average VR headset, but still much, much better than the previous. And they've also made the device more accommodating for people such as myself with glasses. That is definitely a criticism around some of the VR headsets. I've heard that the PlayStation VR, for example, is the most accommodating for people who do need to wear glasses. But the other ones, you know, it's obviously depending on your, or you personally, what glasses you have, all that sort of stuff. But a lot of them not particularly comfortable if you have to wear glasses. So this is definitely something that Microsoft needs to address. Because even though, again, it is not really meant for the average consumer, businesses are going to most likely have a lot of people who wear glasses. So, yeah. Microsoft did also detail to us the battery life. It's about three hours according to what they discussed, which is not actually that bad, to be honest. It's actually better than the Oculus Go mobile headset, for instance, which lasts about two hours. So it's not actually too shabby at all. Now, as I said at the start of this particular segment, Microsoft is not intending this for your eye, right, but they said that HoloLens 3 might where I'll be, and that is coming in a next, well, the next couple of years, basically. So we could maybe potentially see a consumer level HoloLens come in the next two, maybe three years. But of course, even if it does come in those two, three years, it's probably still not going to be cheap, but it's probably going to be at least in the realm of affordable. But we do actually have raw specs for you now to finish off this particular topic. We see a Qualcomm Snapdragon 850, and we see equivalent of a 2K display for each eye, which is 47 pixels per degree, and again, that 52 degree field of view. We see it weighing 566 grams, or 1.25 pounds, which is actually a little bit less than the original, which weighed 579 grams, or 1.28 pounds. And we also see built-in spatial audio as well. So all very interesting, and definitely an improvement on the original, but again, it's going to be quite some time before we see this hit any store shelves anytime soon. But we have quite a bit to get through today, so I'm going to move over to our next topic, which is actually regarding AMD and ray tracing. Now, in a statement to DSOgaming.com, AMD have apparently said to them that their... DX12 GPUs can actually use, or could actually use, ray tracing via Microsoft's DXR fallback layer, which basically means that it could allow ray tracing to be emulated is the best way to put it. So hypothetically, 
any AMD graphics card that supports DX12 could be capable of rendering ray tracing graphics, but AMD have, of course has chosen not to release the driver update to make that happen or really push any support for this. And I'm sure you can see the reason why the second I said the word emulated, because well, even Nvidia's RTX cards, which of course have the hardware built in to do ray tracing and obviously I've got the DLSS, DLSS excuse me, support to try and take some of the load off and increase performance. We have still not really seen a huge amount of support for ray tracing and have seen some, I wouldn't say disappointing, but perhaps not as high as you would hope performance numbers even on the very top end RTX 2080 Ti, just because that's how demanding ray tracing actually is. So if you add emulation into the mix, you can kind of see why AMD have not deigned to actually do this. At least with their current line of cards, we might see that change when they release their sort of next top end cards. Obviously, we don't know what's going on with, really with Navi or, or Arcturus. You know, we could see either of those uh, particular graphics card lines released with a really top end card that does ha have ray tracing capabilities. Or we could say AMD decide not to go that route because, again, we have not really seen ray tracing take off. There's been very little support for it so far. Of course, that could very much change over the next few years, and, and I'm sure AMD are keeping an eye on how much interest is actually gathering to see whether or not it's going to be worth their investment for the future but for the moment at least I wouldn't expect it. But we're going to move on to our next topic which is actually regarding Intel Ice Lake. Now I have discussed many times as have many other people how Intel's 10 and M just seems to be perpetually delayed. Of course, there was even reports that it was cancelled, which Intel were very keen to deny. And of course, we have seen much more information be released about Ice Lake. We do actually know vaguely what's going on with the, that 10 and m release. And we are expecting it to be coming out holiday this year, essentially. But those expectations could actually be subverted if this new leak is correct as there has been a alleged leaked Lenovo document, which does show that we could potentially see Ice Lake as soon as June. Now, as with any leaks, take this with a pinch of salt, but it does actually line up with something that Dell have officially confirmed. So perhaps you would give this leak a little more credence while still holding tightly onto that salt that I just mentioned. So these documents were posted to the r slash ThinkPad subreddit and they basically show that the 2019 refresh will include a new X1 Yoga lineup which supports Ice Lake Core i5 and i7 and again is going to be launching in June. And those documents do not stop there actually, it also states that we're going to be seeing an X1 Carbon lineup from Lenovo with Ice Lake processors coming in August of this year. So basically we're going to be seeing a one in June and then another in August, which of course is much ahead of the expected holiday 2019 release. Now the documents do also show, for example, both Whiskey Lake and Coffee Lake processors as well as, of course, Ice Lake. So it seems Intel have finally cracked whatever was holding them back with 10M, 10NM, excuse me, if these leaks are to be believed, and we're going to be seeing plenty of stock available for companies, enough for Lenovo to basically do a entire refresh. Now, it's entirely possible that it's launching early just for notepads, and then we're, and obviously laptops and all that sort of thing and then we could see the actual sort of desktop release in the holiday that that would actually kind of make sense in a way but either way we're going to be potentially seeing ice lake earlier than expected which is definitely going to be nice because I'm, i was half expecting it to be like yep 10 and m has been delayed again won't be seeing it till 2020 because you know that's just how meme level these delays with this particular process uh, architecture have actually gotten. So I'm looking forward to seeing how accurate this actually is. This would of course line up pretty nicely with Computex as well and of course would definitely help Intel out as AMD are of course expected to unveil more about their 7nm desktop processors at Computex. So of course if Intel had something of their own to show or at least released or something like that that would definitely help them because AMD have very much been capitalizing on Intel's woes with 14nm and of course the 
delays and delays and delays of 10nm so it would make perfect sense for intel to do this even if it was a limited release on notebooks and laptops only it would still be a nice marketing spin for them to be able to challenge amd uh, directly around the time of Computex but of course this could all be 100% incorrect or it could be outdated could be fake could be all of the above somehow either way won't be terribly long before we find out exactly how wrong or right this actually is but do let me know your thoughts on everything I have discussed here today guys uh, thank you very much for watching your support is always appreciated so do give us a like and subscribe if you haven't done so already it does help out a great deal and I will see you next time